Welcome, good evening, good morning, good afternoon. She Means Business is a joint event of IMEX and TW Magazine in partnership with MPI. She Means Business is an international conference about diversity, gender equality, and female empowerment, not just for women in business and events, but also with the support of their male counterparts. It is about celebrating the role of women in business and events. My name is Zoe Moore, your moderator for today. Over the next 40 minutes, we're gonna to travel to Chicago, Illinois to speak with Michelle Mason, President and CEO of Association Forum. We're going to Nairobi, Kenya to speak to Jacinta Zioka, National Coordinator and CEO of Kenya CVB. We're going to Cologne, Germany to speak with Phyllis Yuk of the Cologne Convention Bureau and Newark, New Jersey to speak with Avita Robinson, founder of the Nomadness Travel Tribe. We'll be joining them in their virtual boardrooms to talk about how they're implementing diversity, gender equality, and female empowerment in their organizations. We're also gonna address the topic of anti-racism because as a black woman, I need to know how my industry supports empowering professionals that look like me because representation matters. The sponsor for today's She Means Business panel is Kalahari Resorts and Conventions. Today, I encourage you to use the chat as much as possible or as much as you like, but encourage you to use the Slido feature, which is on your right-hand side, and for questions for our speakers, mainly because questions can get lost in the chat and we would not want that to happen. On the right-hand side of your screen, you will see the Slido and you will be able to submit your questions there. Let's begin with trying that feature. The first question in Slido, what is the benefit of more women leading hospitality companies, specifically in the tourism industry? I wanna hear your thoughts or see your thoughts. So take a moment just to do that. All right. So Michelle, we're going to Chicago first and about 77% of, of the respondents say it's public perception. How do you feel about that opinion, Michelle? Well, you know, I think that uh, that's a very interesting um, opinion. I think women in the industry, uh, the hospitality industry in particular, um, bring a very important um, voice. First of all, thanks for having me. <laughs> bring a very important voice uh, to the whole equation. When we think about women in the hospitality in industry and how women influence business, it's very important to recognize that women bring a very fresh perspective. We also recognize that women represent 70% of the uh, workforce. Course, research will tell you that when you have gender and racial diversity, you're going to have a higher level of uh, stronger economic measures. But I think now more than ever before, during these times of uncertainty, the importance of having women in business and in leadership is because they bring empathy and compassion to the workforce. We're living in very uncertain times. We're living in periods of isolation and mental uh, wellness is very important. The sense of Connectivity, and I think this is a time like no other, like no other, where women definitely are stepping up and leading the charge. Absolutely, yes, definitely. Thank you so much for joining us today. Yeah, and the audience and I want to join you in your boardroom and talk to you about inclusion and developing culture. How does the Association Forum's initiative, we, which stands for Welcoming Environment, empower women? That's a great question. I'll first start with defining what we mean by welcoming the environment. We um, Association Forum coined the term and the term in 2014 because we recognized that we had an opportunity to start with inclusion first. Within that, you have diversity, you have very strong representation. And what we mean by welcoming the environment is that it is a is a is a concept that helps organizations understand that uniquenesses are valued, uniquenesses are strengths in organizations. They are respected and they're used as a strategic advantage. And so when we think about empathy and we think about compassion and we think about empowering women, there's a strong correlation because it's really about people and it's about humanizing people. And so when we look at welcoming environment, it provides a space, it provides a conversation for women to feel empowered. It provides an opportunity for women to say, yes, I might be vulnerable, but that's okay because it, again, brings more personality and character to my 
organization. And so as we evolve from these crises that we're experiencing, I think it's going to be more important than ever before. And I'll just kind of end my comment with the fact that we just recently conducted research and we, rep and we recognize that inclusion is a driving factor of change in organizations. People want to understand Want you to know who they are and they we, who who am I and understand the strengths that I bring to an organization. So in the boardroom, women have a way of making that happen, not only in conversation but also in action. Yeah, I like that. And there's several points you made about inclusion being first. I often say when inclusion is the behavior, diversity yeah. will be the result. Right. And you're talking about women being nurturers, being our authentic selves. Mm -hmm. so definitely. Thank you for sharing that. How, how do you believe um, that the we at, that we at the Association Forum can be a model for properly addressing anti uh, racism? How does that correlate? Absolutely. Well, I always, when I answer that question, I, I say, well, first we have to recognize that racism is a problem, right? And when you recognize a problem, you need to understand that there are conversations you should have to address the problem. And so how we position we within associations is have the tough conversations, the, uncom the uncomfortable conversations with your membership. We know that associations represent very diverse constituencies, and there are some that think they're doing well, but when we really look at the research we just conducted, there are huge gaps. There's a gap in what we say we do, and there's a gap in what we really know we should be doing. And I believe now, more than ever before, before over the past seven months, there has been a public outcry for there to be a level of change. And so we see welcoming the environment being a model, being a concept that can open up conversations with a broad um, diversity of groups to realize the change they wish to see and the impact within their organizations and communities. Absolutely. I love it. I love acronyms. I love <laughs> initiatives that have a mission and that's key to strategy. So great. Can you take a, a minute or so and tell us how you would advise associations to take action towards empowering more women of color to lead in business, specifically tourism in our industry? Absolutely. I think that's a great question. And, I, and, and oftentimes I will say when I'm advising that we first have to recognize that many women of color feel like they are the only one, right? They are dealing with burdens that others don't necessarily have to encounter. There's discrimination, there's stereotypes, there's gender bias. So first you must recognize when I say the problem, that's an issue and understand where they are in order to be able to cultivate and develop a relationship and support them. And support manifests in different ways through sponsorship, allyship, mentorship. But there are three areas that I think will be important for organizations to understand. When you're developing a culture and you're supporting women of color, create welcoming environments, communities where they can be successful. It recognize that women of different sizes, shapes, hues, that is a strategic advantage to the business. Actively seek their feedback. If you're at the table where you're making decisions and you do not see them, be that sponsor, be that ally and support them at the table and make sure that their voice is heard. And, all, and obviously given, giving the opportunity. I think in these hospitality community now uh, due to the stress that the community uh, is under, uh, there uh, the diversity of thought, the diversity of opinion, and just what women fundamentally bring to to the conversations, as I shared earlier, is a strategic advantage. And I would also say a business imperative. Absolutely. And I, I want to take a moment to read that poll correctly because I misread it. Um, the opinion of that question, what is the benefit of more women leading hospitality companies? Nice to have was 12%. Increases the bottom line, 25%. Leadership style was 77%, not public perception, while public perception was 15% and improved succession planning, 29%. So the audience agrees with you that 77% of leadership style, that nurturing that you mentioned. So I want to go into, thank you so much, Michelle. I, I literally could talk to you. Let's uh, make sure I come to Chicago and, and grab something to drink. So Let's leave Chicago and next we're gonna go to Kenya, Nairobi, Kenya, but first we're gonna do a poll. The poll, how many women CEOs lead CVBs across the top 50 tourism market, markets globally? Let's see what people have in there. Okay, they're coming in, I think we're done. 
Less than 100 was 73%. People guessed 100 to 500, 24%. Yes, um, those numbers, I would say the, the data is inconclusive, that our industry needs to do a better job at collecting that, in, in, uh, that information because we don't have a collective number that represents every year right, at one given time. So let's go to Nairobi, Kenya, and speak with Jacinta Zioka. Hi, Jacinta, how are you? Good, thank you, Zo. Thank you for having me. Absolutely. Were you aware of that, that data? Did you know that there's minimal representation of women in CVBs? Oh, yes. Uh, this data is uh, reflected also within my continent and um, uh, not just CVBs, but also tourism boards and um, other institutions in our industry. And um, it's, it just, you know, confirms really what the issue is at hand that we are talking about, that we need inclusivity, we need gender equality, if really we must achieve SDG number five, where women and girls uh, need to be empowered. Absolutely. Absolutely. So, okay. So we're in Kenya, we're in your virtual boardroom. And the conversation is how gender equality, how does gender equality move from being government mandated, which it is right now, to fully embrace as good for the economy? So my question to you is, how are you helping to support the cha uh, support changing the narrative by empowering future leaders, specifically young women? Thank you, that's a brilliant question. And welcome to my boardroom. My board is actually chaired by a woman. And to move further towards inclusivity, the woman is a Muslim woman. And she chairs that board as the principal secretary responsible for tourism in our country. That is already something that is great for us. And we see a lot of move to get women leaders at the top in, in our country. Uh, since 2010, Kenya got a new constitution that mandates that every uh, government institution, even private, has a third of either gender in leadership, in staff establishments, and we are doing the same. At our convention bureau, I am the leader in, in that uh, team of eight, and 50% are women. And we try to observe that a third rule gender in everything, including access to government procurement um, um, opportunities for the youth, women, and people with disabilities. That is in our constitution. So as institutions, we must, and we have to report to government regularly how we are doing every quarter of the financial year to ensure that we align and we adhere to uh, those regulations. That also applies to private sector. I am one of the founder members of the Kenya Association of Women in Tourism, which we founded 10 years ago. And as women who are, we wanted a platform where we can get you know, empowerment through either advocacy, policy, and actually proper empowerment through training and mentorship. And what we do in this is that women from both private and public are encouraged to mentor young girls and ladies in high school and also in colleges. Number one, to appreciate tourism as a career. We come from a continent and a country where tourism is a bit seen as a foreign you know, business. And so for women to feel that yes, they can work in, 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 in a hotel, they can work as a tour guide, they can work you know, in the bar, those are opportunities for us to help women overcome some struggles, especially related to culture and also religion. The other thing, of course, is for us to give them capacity building. We do mentorship programs in our Association of Women in Tourism. We visit, we give them opportunities as interns in our organizations. We were recognized and given an opportunity by our Ministry of Tourism and the UNWTO a year ago to train young women as our as mentors in a program that was fully sponsored by UNWTO for women and young girls that are in um, uh, marginalized areas, in you know they live in slums, they cannot afford education, and we brought these women into our industry. One of them actually worked with the Kenya National Tourism Board, where I worked before the Convention Bureau, and these are things that we encourage the women to do. The other things, of course, about 
corporate social responsibility as we look at having legacy impact in our industry is key because host communities where our tourism industry is found should benefit from tourism. So sustainability for us is key and it is a theme that runs across our businesses, tourism, meetings industry, and, and, and our national tourism blueprint is anchored around sustainability. Absolutely. I, oh, like I said, I could talk to you for hours. That was powerful. And what I hear is mentorship, representation, and leadership, and that you're, you're really changing the narrative around what tourism means to these young women. So when we talk about changing the narrative, let's talk about anti-racism. How does the history of colonization in Kenya impact how you and other leaders in tourism address the need for anti-racism globally? Uh, th thanks for that question. And it comes at a time when, uh, of course, um, the uh, Black Lives Matter movement was also uh, witnessed here in our country where we felt the connection with, with what was happening in, in the US and around the world. Um, being a former British colony, we find that even our tourism industry, the models around which tourism was established in Kenya is around foreign market needs, ignoring that domestic tourism or regional tourism within the continent can also play a part in, in our economy. So we find that about 20 to 10 years ago, there were very few practitioners in the industry that were focusing on the domestic market. So these models have had to change because we have a young, vibrant, and, 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 and you know, exposed traveler within the, within, the, within the region that wants to explore and enjoy the, 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 their, their continent. So we find that some of the new companies that have come up are focusing specifically on domestic tourism, and they are doing very well. Right now, during the pandemic, our industry is thriving because of domestic tourism. Those that had still those models around foreign markets only are suffering. And so it's a wake up call, I think, for us and for the whole world to really look within and find solutions and products and experiences starting from building our own industry because a firm and a strong domestic tourism supports a great international tourism. I see a lot of travel within, within, within uh, our region and the fact that those models are slowly being broken down of course, there is resistance to change by, by many people, and we're human beings, and we, we resist change. But those that are changing and adopting the new way and are looking at, you know, uh, Kenyans and residents as a market are doing well. The other thing is about um, um, conservation. Our conservation also models were around um, uh, foreign models. And we find that today we have about 35 conservancies land owned by locals that have given it up for conservation so that they can benefit from conservation and also wildlife-based tourism. So we encourage our people to come up with community-based tourism you know, products, come up with especially cultural-based um, uh, experiences so that they can showcase their culture they can be proud of it, you know, and be able to, 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 to work on on it as tourism as a business. So that is for us something that is transforming. It is, it is not 100%. We are getting there because today 55% of bed nights within the country are by locals. So we, we, we are proud to see that we are one of the countries within the region that has, has moved from you know, getting stuck around colonization or around foreign markets only to embrace you know, the Kenyan as a, as a, as a market. Well, absolutely. Thank you so much, Jacinta, for your time. I appreciate you sharing that. Um, and now we're going to leave Nairobi, Kenya and go to Cologne, Germany. But first, we're going to do our last and final poll. Um, actually, um, excuse me, we'll do the poll after Phyllis, after we leave Cologne, Germany. So Phyllis, how are you today? Hello, Zoe. I'm fine. Thank you. <laughs> Yeah, how do you feel about the the previous poll? Um, did you were you aware of that data as far as women representation in CVBs? Um, I I wasn't aware of that, but um, 
that was the number I I would guess where where the the where the results come from. So uh, where all the results would end up. Um, it's right. it's not a surprise for me. Not a surprise, definitely, and that's unfortunate. But so let's let's talk real quick. So as the the head or the leader of the Cologne Visitors Bureau in Germany, in Cologne, Germany. Um, the conversation in your boardroom focuses on education as an empower, empowerment tool to help women recognize their value as powerful leaders. How are you helping to lead this conversation in your role and in tourism? Yeah. First of all, it's it's very important to, to get this conversation started um, be, because I, I think um, we we always uh, sometimes miss the stage um, to to enter a conversation like this as early as possible. I mean, of, of course, we we already talk a lot about diversity strategies, or or we read a lot of um, statistics and studies, and also quite up to date in Germany. Again, discussions about the law on a quota of women in boardrooms, and uh, for example, this. This law says that there have to be a minimum of 40% women on the executive boards or something like um, public corporate governance codex for the public service. And in, in my opinion, this shows us once again uh, the failure of, the, of, of politics in Germany because um, basically Germany is not at the point where the conversation focuses on the right stage, um, quite on the contrary. So Germany starts, starts at the wrong end. So what I want to say um, is we, we should focus this conversation on education as an empowerment tool to create powerful women leaders. I mean, we, we all know that what we once learned will not be forgotten, forgotten so, so quickly. So instead of focusing on, uh, on half considered decisions like 40% more women on, on executive boardrooms, uh, we should get to the bottom of the reason for this need. And one of the reasons for, for this is that our upbringing has not evolved with the change in society. So, for example, and uh, with reference to a study of the German-Swedish um, Albright Foundation, um, this study shows us that we have even reached the point where we are seeing a decline in the number of women on, on, on the boards. So, in particularly, this... Um, in, in those of the uh, DA export members, that's the German stock index. Only 12.8% of the managing board is female. So that's why I was not surprised of the results um, from the poll before. And also according to this study, 55 of those companies without women on the executive board, they do not plan to change anything. They stick to the goal of zero women. So um, how I help to lead this conversation in my role, um, we should stop thinking of gender-specific role assignments. I, I was born in Germany. My mother is German, my father is from Turkey. So when most of the people here, I'm half Turkish, half German, they start thinking, um, well, she was, she was brought up strictly according to the belief of um, Islam as a religion, or because my father father is from Turkey, so that is that is what people like, expect to hear. But what they don't expect, however, is um, that as a girl, I was raised to 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 be able to to do and achieve everything I set out to do. So there was no one uh, in my childhood, like my parents or my my siblings, who told me I I cannot do this or that because I'm a girl. So it never occurred to me to um, as, a, as a girl not to, to play soccer, to skateboard, or not to play with boys. That, that was only when I, when I got older. Then I realized I would always be offended by this because the majority of our society was not raised or educated in, in the way I was raised. Um, and I, I, I'm still glad, glad uh, that I never doubted my attitude. So I always believe, still believe that I can do anything and don't think about gender specific role assignments. So 
I think we, we could save ourselves this conversation if gender specific role assignments were, were finally a thing of the past. So uh, another example, um, we should quit saying, just be careful to a girl who goes to the jungle gym on a playground and would, uh, while well, we would uh, say, uh, great what you dare to a boy. So there's always this, this, uh, dif the difference between uh, gender roles when when we grow up and um, to, to summarize um, all, all my thoughts <laughs> I would say we should start with the youngest and not with the oldest to to create diverse leaders so we need to change some attitudes Absolutely. I mean, I again, like you're you're working to change the narrative through education, and that's key. And and I'm glad you're in a leadership position so that you can represent that change that needs to take place. And I agree with you. So thank you so much, Phyllis. Um, really appreciate having you. And we're gonna stay tuned. We're gonna have some more questions after. We're also gonna do a poll before we go to Newark, New Jersey. The poll is how many black indigenous people of color women have businesses or are entrepreneurs in the tourism industry today so let's go ahead and answer that question less than 10 percent people say that's about 55 percent of the audience says less than 10 percent uh 10 to 30 percent 40 percent of the audience uh 30 to 50 percent five percent of the audience. Well, I, you know, I'm going to go to the expert that's in data and she's a new worker and her name is Avita Robinson. Hi, Avita. How are you? I'm good. How are you doing? Doing all right. What do you think about those numbers? Do you think people know? Do you think the data is out there? I know I'm one of them. I know. <laughs> <laughs> it's about as far into it as I think I can get in regards to this. Um, I think looking at these numbers, how many BIPOC women um, have businesses? It's interesting, right? I'm going to say that I'm probably somewhere around the 10 to 30 percent. And the reason why I'm choosing that is because what we found, particularly in the United States, when it comes to what's known as like the black travel movement and what's been happening and, you know, my company and community, Nomadness Travel Tribe, we're noticing that the people who have really changed the story, at least in the States and representing our demographics are women. It's a lot of women. And there are a number of them that I could name off the top of my hand because a number of them started off as Nomadness members. You know, my community is 25,000 plus members around the world and we're 78% female, black female in our, our tribe, right? And so um, with that, I've seen so many spinoffs, entrepreneurs, people are in the travel sector, other people who just want to become location independent and have, you know, handed in their pink slip, left their job, packed up their family and decided that they were going to move or travel abroad for an extended period of time. So I think I see the manifestation of this on a daily basis um, because I work in the intersection of community. You know, um, I'm kind of the, I'm the liaison between the industry and the people that the industry are trying to attract, the people that the industry are trying to serve, you know, for those that are on it when it comes to the diversity initiatives and intersectionality, which is my favorite term nowadays. Um, I see it from that end, but what I can say for sure is I'm one of them. <laughs> Wow. Yeah. Thank you so much. Thank you for sharing that. And yes, you are one of them and I am excited to talk to you. So as the founder of Nomadness Travel Tribe and creator of the Audacity DigiFest, uh, which well, actually it pivoted, Audacity Fest pivoted to the DigiFest, correct? Uh, due to COVID-19, you're empowering Black tourists, especially Black women, uh, which make up 78% or more probably now of your followers uh, to travel worldwide. How are you using the understanding of those uh, of your audience to serve uh, to, to serve those? And how does data support you advocating uh, industry wide? Right. So coming from the community side of things, I have this kind of like internal focus group that is already a part of my business model. I have 25,000 people plus around the world that are more than eager to give their opinions when asked and sometimes when not asked <laughs> on what they think and what they want. I think also what's very unique for me, too, is that I am a member of Nomadness. When people ask us, you know, what is the demographic of your your group look like of travelers? I'm like, honestly, they look like me. 78% female, black female 
female, location independent, a number of them of entrepreneurs. We have a smaller subset that are also parents. Um, you know, some are married. And so really being able to chime in and go directly to what you all would consider the consumer for us, they're a part of my community. You know, I'm very much, I say I'm a part of Nomadness as much as I am the leader of it, right? So what they, what I need and I see that's lacking in the industry, I also know that they need. And it allows my team to also trust our instincts a lot more because it's intuitive because it's us, you know? So there's that part of it. Um, but I'm very big on asking. One of the things that happened when COVID first hit earlier this summer late spring, early summer was, um, you know, everybody got emails. They got inundated with emails. Any website you ever signed up for was sending you an email about these are the terms and conditions. This is how we're dealing with COVID. Did I was like, if I get one more email, I swear. <laughs> and so all these emails were coming, but what was standing out to me so much in these emails is everybody was talking at you and nobody was asking you what you needed in that moment. Nobody was being reflective and coming from a place of empathy. They were doing what they needed to do for their business. And as a business owner, trust me, I get it. I understand. But the first email that came out from Nomadness to our community, one, it did not come right away. It was not rushed. It was about a good like two to almost three weeks into what we were dealing with with COVID. And two, it was also literally the tagline, the subject line of it was, how can we best serve you right now? And we gave them a very quick, very succinct five question poll, just asking them, hey, these are the ways that we have the capacity to come out and to speak with you. But let us know if this is even relevant to you. You know, I saw some other travel brands that were like, OK, we're doing masterminds right now on how to make money off of travel. I'm like, this is tone deaf. Nobody's going anywhere right now. Nobody's talking about being a travel influencer right now. They want to know how they're going to eat tomorrow. And so it was, we wanted to make sure that we were not disconnected from not just our community and their needs, but also the humanity in the situation, you know? And I think a lot of companies sometimes like you get so wrapped up in your bottom line and what you do every day and what's worked for you in the past that you don't take a step back to assess the situation as a human being, going through some of the things that this has put people through, right? So I think for us, that's how it started. And as you mentioned, literally, we doubled down in two ways. We got very, very succinct, very focused, and very narrow. The two things that we did starting at the end of March is one, we pivoted our Audacity Fest. As you said, we were expecting a thousand plus people in New York about a month and a half ago um, for our third installment of Audacity Fest. That is our travel festival for travelers of color and our allies. Literally, that's our tagline of our community and of our event. Um, we pivoted to Audacity Digi and we did it fast and we did it hard. Luckily, it was also successful. <laughs> our first iteration was on May 30th. Our second iteration was on August 1st. And our third iteration is actually September, October 24th. So it's coming up in about a week and a half. Um, we've been able to break that barrier. You know, one of the silver linings of COVID, if you will, is now we don't have to worry about the financial barriers. If there's somebody that is in Cologne or somebody that is in Kenya that has wanted to attend Audacity Fest but hasn't been able to pay for the flight and the hotel and commit to the ticket. Now there's an online version just as valuable, just as fun too, which to me is, is important. It's got to have our swag. So, you know, just as entertaining of an event, but it's digital and now it's happening. And it, we got such good reception and our partnerships have been coming in um, with different boards of tourism. You know, Experience Grand Rapids was a huge one for this. Pandora Music was another one. Visit Baltimore. All of these companies have come in and sponsored the event because we're getting hundreds of you know, BIPOC travel writers, content creators, influencers all together in one spot. And you never see that anywhere else. So Audacity Digi was great. The other thing that we doubled down on was data. As BIPOC people, we have got to take it seriously about owning our information. This is where the money is. This is where the information is. This is where the decisions are being made. So we give over, we are consumers, mass consumers of so many of these things, so many industries, so much data. We are in here, we build culture, we drive culture. It starts with us, but we don't own any of it. And so for us, it was so important that we got to a point of saying, okay, look, up to this point, 
There's only been one data set and data research company that has come out with this thing and everybody's running with the numbers. We assessed it. We realized that we could get a much larger sample size than what was already out in the industry because we in-house have a community of over 25,000 travelers. Like we are the people and that's what was really important. So what we've done through the Nomadness uh, Diversity and Travel Consensus Survey is we actually created our own survey we closed it in the middle of September. We're actually partnered with Tourism Reset through the University of Tennessee, who's in our data analysis right now. And we had over 5,000 people fill out our survey. And these are the people. These are the folks that you want your marketing to hit to. And, and, and what we're doing is our tagline for the survey is we're bringing our numbers to life. It is both a quantitative and a qualitative view. And we are actually gonna be talking about and revealing the trends that we found from our data research on December 10th. We're doing an online event, kind of like Audacity Digi before the industry. And we're inviting the industry to come in and we're not only gonna be revealing our trends, we're also gonna be hosting a panel with some of the actual travelers who took our survey that represent these trends so that we can bring the numbers to life. That is what it's about. You need to understand these people, not just the number that they associate with. Who are they? What do they feel? What motivates them? How important is it to them to see themselves represented in, in travel marketing? These are the questions we're going to be answering. And our, our actual data um, report is going to be for sale on December 10th too. So I have some press that's coming over the next couple months that I'll be dropping a couple dimes in on some of the trends. But if you want to see the full trend presentation, the um the panel with like i said bringing the numbers to life as well as get your hands on the data report first you'll be able to come to the december 10th event and we're also going to have the ability to customize reports so say you know jacinto is like we need to know who from the ages of 25 to 45 filled this out from kenya or has traveled to kenya and we want our own customizable report because we own the data and we have it on the back end we can now produce also customizable reports from the sample set that we took over over covid so Absolutely. i'm super excited those are the two you could tell them hype those are the oh, two no. <laughs> that no, I mean, we've been working on for yeah. the last six months and i'm i just want to say from me to your ears i am proud of you like you have you. literally you. i haven't joined the madness travel tribe but i have been watching you and i'm excited to meet all of you and i, I just thank you avita for all of that and i look forward to attending G digifest and and everything that you have going on i look forward to coming to nairobi and seeing you jacinta i'll be there with sky in one of my favorite companies that goes to kenya i'm coming to cologne and i'll be in chicago Soon, Michelle, I'll be out there. But just real quick, we have like maybe one question from the audience because it was so good. So I'm going to throw one question out to the group. Um, we talk a lot about diversity, but what does inclusion mean to each of you? Real quick, someone, what does it mean to, to you, Phyllis? What does inclusion mean to you? Hi, Phyllis, how are you? Hi, Phyllis. How are you? Yeah, fine. Uh, so in, inclusion for me means um, I think there's not much of a difference between diversity and inclusion because inclusion is part of diversity. So um, most of the people think only about diversity uh, when they think about um, ethnic origin or age or gender, but it's also inclusion. So we need to, to think about um, disability and we need to, to in, include everyone. So in, in, in my opinion, there's not much of a difference between diversity and inclusion. Oh, it thank you belongs so much, together Phyllis. for me. Yeah. And thank you to all the panelists. I um, and we are at the end of our time. We are at the end of our time. But I just want to I look forward to talking to each of you, so look out for my email, and I'm sure we'll be doing this again soon. All right, have a wonderful day, and thank you, audience, for attending and traveling around the world with me. And thank you. All right.